on Facebook, uh, Apple, YouTube, all the other platforms that it's um, being streamed on. And Lord, we just ask today that you would just open our hearts and our ears, Lord God, so that we can maybe learn some things that we did not know or don't know, Lord God, and just ask questions and see what their personal journeys were like, Lord God. We just thank you that we have this opportunity because education and awareness is so key with any disease or sickness or anything that's going on with your body, Lord God. And as I stated, my mother passed from breast cancer, but I didn't know much about it. I didn't research about it. Um, still don't know much about it. But uh, today, I believe I will learn some important information, and I do have questions. So we just thank you on today for this opportunity, for the timing, and just ask that you be with us in the midst of our show today, and just um, be with us. And we thank you, we praise you, we give you glory and honor. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So ladies, I want to ask you if you could kind of travel us through, you know, kind of your journey a little bit, you know, just help us a little bit because, you know, we have both of you ladies who are amazing survivors and we would love to hear a little bit about, you know, what it is like, not only for, you know, prevention, for cancer awareness, but also for how it is for detection. And so if you can, and I'm going to start off with Francesca, if you can kind of give us, you know, your journey as a breast cancer um, survivor and give us kind of what happened through your journey, um, what started off as being a breast cancer survivor. Can you give us that? Yeah. Um, I was diagnosed when I was 29. So that was about three years ago. And I found my own lump. Um, I was, you know, just showering and stuff. And I just noticed that there was this lump in my breast. Um, so at first I kind of disregarded it and thinking, you know, you know, it's, it's probably nothing serious, but then it kept uh, persisting. The lump didn't go away. It seemed to get larger and larger and then became painful, like a sharp pain in my chest. Um, then I would go to my doctor and by me being so young, she wasn't really, um, an advocate per se for going to get like a mammogram or a breast exam because that's not typically something you see in someone of my in my age range um but you know i constantly kept going and said something's not right something's not right and finally you know six months kind of down the line she uh go, sent me to do the ultrasound a mammogram and i went to go see a surgeon and that's when um, they discussed my options and they did a biopsy. And once they did the biopsy, maybe two days later, they called and said that I had a stage zero breast cancer, which was meaning that it's just in the ducts. It didn't, wasn't, it was non-invasive at that time. Um, so that's kind of how it started. And then um, Chris, around Christmas, of 2017, that's when I actually had the breast removed. Both, I did a bilateral mastectomy, had both breasts removed, and I was going to do the reconstruction process at the same time, which is most of the time what they recommend, that you can just do both. Um, but I ended up getting a really bad infection. Um, I'm not sure if the infection came from the reconstruction process or me just being week to week to handle it at that time, but they had to remove it. All of the expanders and stuff had to come out. And I had three more surgeries after that for them just to clean up, remove the rest of the dead skin. Um, Cause I went into almost going into septic shock is when your uh, organs start to fail. So I had to get all that stuff taken out and removed, um, you know, so I could have my life. And then once, um, all that was done, I decided that I was just going to probably stay flat for a long time because just being nervous and scared of having to go back through the process and stuff again. But um, recently, I decided that um, you know, I'm not going to let fear hold me back. And I decided to go back through with the reconstruction process. And everything has been great. Um, last Christmas, I was able to get the implants, the uh, expanders put back in mm. and 
every two weeks, you know, they go and fill you up with uh, your sailing, your CCs and stuff until you get to whatever size you want to be. And then June, the day right before my birthday, I, were, I was able to get my implants put in. Wow. So that was like the best birthday gift ever. <laughs> wow. That's awesome. <laughs> So That's then, amazing. Um, That's an amazing yeah, world. yeah. So three weeks, three weeks, about three weeks ago, I was able to do the nipple part. And then in December, they'll actually do the areola. So it's a marathon. It's not a sprint at all. Like you definitely have to have some patience with doing breast cancer as far as the reconstruction process goes. And that's one thing I have learned since going through all of this is my patience. It's just being patient and just waiting for the right time and not rushing. Yeah. And and I think I think that's beautiful because, you know, you put it very eloquently about being patient. You know, a lot of people don't know that it's about patience. It's a patient process. And, you know, that it's not, you know, a fast moving pace. It's about patience. You know, a lot of people say, well, patience is a virtue. Um, but for this process you know, virtual, you know, virtuously, um, we're, we're kind of waiting on God for that strength that mm-hmm. gives us dignity. And so, you know, we're waiting on that, that, that virtuosity. Um, so I'd love to hear your story as well. I'd love to hear your story, Lindsay. Um, how w- was your story of strength Um, of being a survivor and how was your process of how you got here you know and and I know that you're kind of still going through the process but I let's hear let's hear where you're at right now oh my gosh I'm in the headache phase like hurry up and be over I just told my mom and my husband today like hurry up so I was diagnosed in 2016 I got married on September the 10th I was diagnosed on September the 13th. Okay. So we went straight from for better or for worse to for worse and then for better. But this has definitely been um, a very long process for the past four years. I found my um, my tumor on my own. As I said, the the, the night of my wedding, actually, um, I woke up and there it was. I immediately called the doctor because of my history. So I started back sometime around 1993. I had fibroid adenoid fibroid adenoma tumors very early. So throughout the several years, I've had lots of breast surgery, several biopsies, mammograms very early because for some reason, my breasts produced fibroid adenomas whenever they felt like it. At 13, I had four and each breast the size of golf balls. Mm. So within that process, I've just been monitored very closely by my physicians, my GYN, and on September and in September, Pow, there it was. I got the shock of my life, um, which I was not expecting. Soon, right after that, I immediately began treatment. I would say I went from having, I had had solid tumors. So I was diagnosed with stage zero in one breast and two B in the other breast. I had a double mastectomy in November, November the 5th to be exact. And I decided to choose to go with the mastectomy as well as the reconstruction at the same time. Okay. Well, to my knowledge, I thought everything was going to go well, and my body rejected the implants. Oh, okay. So from there, my body rejected the implants four times. So I have had a total of 15 surgeries, my 15th surgery being October the 5th, about three weeks ago, which was my last phase, which was the nipple and the areola phase. So yay, we made it to there. So after my body rejected the four different types of implants and the final one, my plastic surgeon was like, look, we're not going to do this. We're just going to start building up from the fatty tissue in your body. So we did fat transfers. So it was basically minor lipo surgeries where they took fat from my inner thighs, my stomach, my back area to build up my breasts. And then the final phase was on October the 5th where we did the reconstruction of the nipple and the areola phase. Okay. So I am exhaling for a minute here. I had a hiccup, which I shared with you, Cynthia, earlier. And yeah. so for all of my friends who are watching, who don't know, today was a orientation day for me for radiation again because of a small hiccup. Wow. And, and I have to say, both of you ladies are so strong in your own right because you guys not only have a support system, 
um, that have been through this process with you, um, you with your husband and, and, you know, um, your mom and, and both of you have your moms that are there supporting mm. you and you have a friendship that's, you know, unfathomable. Um, but you have a creator that you guys are sitting here going, you know what, no matter what, I know that God's still sustaining me no matter what the situation. And I know that I have an unshakable faith that's, you know, and, and even mm. through this, you still are saying it's the minor hiccup. It's a hiccup. It's a, it's um, a hiccup. <laughs> it's a hiccup. You're like, it's a hiccup. It's a hiccup. Um, and, and even through that, both of you are saying, oh, it's a hiccup, mm, you know, even through that. Um, and it's, it's bringing people to, I think when they watch this, they can still say, um, no matter what, I can still go through this process and it's still gonna be okay. And it gives people hope, you know, to understand that, uh, you know, you can still go through this process and, and, and still come out in the other end. Okay. Um, no matter what, what can happen to you you can still be a survivor um i hope that you guys can come call in please call in at 1-855-493-6499 we hope that you have questions through these stories of these amazing ladies if you have any questions if you have stories of your own as a survivor if you're a cancer patient of, uh, uh, as well or if you are a family member we'd love to hear your stories uh, we'd love to hear you. Please call 1-855-493-6499. Um, so, let me, can I, let me interject here because I have a question for both of you all. Yes. So both, both of you all said you found your own lump. Like I said, my mom had breast cancer about uh, maybe five years ago when I had my mammogram. I had an abnormal one, um, but they said it was just fatty tissue. So for that next year, I was getting them every six months instead of once a year. But in, in my mind, because my mother had it, I'm like, and, and in the same breast, I'm like, okay, it's, it's going to hit me too. So I, I was worried. And then, and, and my doctor's telling me I probably just didn't notice it before that my breast, left breast was bigger than the right, which I'm like, no, it wasn't. No, it wasn't. It wasn't <laughs> like that. I know it wasn't. I know it wasn't. But recently I had some, just like before, some pains in my breast and something, Fran, you had posted um, this month. I saw with like something about the symptoms and it said like if you had a pain in your armpit, mm -hmm. which I had had before and then the pain in my breast. And the only way I could describe the pain to the doctor was if you have a plastic bag and you put a hole in the bottom of it and it feel like it's dripping. It felt like that, but then it was like a, a sharp, like you just go like that, like yeah. a, a quick yeah. sharp I, pain. I, I had that. I just <laughs> had my mammogram uh, on the 13th of this month, and it was fine, but I still had that pain since then. Mm -hmm. So do y'all think it's possible, and, and not that I want to have it, of course. Who who does? Nobody wants to have anything, but something I asked the um. The radiologist, because I paid an extra fifty dollars to get the three D one. Okay. But she, but she told me that even when you get a mammogram, sometimes it doesn't even show it on there. Sometimes that it doesn't even show it. That's true. Yeah, that's true. That's true. So what what would y'all suggest after that? And then also my other question was because I do my own self exams. If it's up to me, I say I feel a lump, but I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what, you know, I don't know. What did you feel? What did you would, describe that? I, I would say to you, Trisha, um, first of all, we have to understand that as African-American women and women that are heavy at the top of both, our breasts are very dense. And not only that, yes, one breast is bigger than the other one. I was just fussing the other day about it. One breast is bigger than the other one. You have to know your body. Mm -hmm. And you have to know that the body changes when we are when we ovulate and during our cycle time. So sometimes when you ovulate or during your cycle, you will notice where there is a nod, a lump, whatever you may call it there. And your doctor will tell you, okay, wait until your cycle goes off and then recheck it again because of your hormone levels. Everything is changing. Well, so I don't kind have of cycle be anymore. 
<laughs> okay, okay. But in uh, well, in that case, go to your doctor. But you have to like know this. You know that certain times of the month when your breast changes, when your body changes, you know where you feel it at, how you feel it, where it's developing at. You have to notice those things and just take note. If you're that concerned, press on your doctor. This is your body. This yes. is your life. Not only that, because your mom had it in your history. You can be tested and have your BRCA gene tested. I tested, I did test BRCA positive. Um, and with that, I monitored very closely because of the history of breast cancer on both sides of my family. I monitored very closely and I go every six months for a mammogram and a ultrasound. However, some insurances don't cover the bracket test because it's very expensive and you may have to cover out of pocket. But because of your history and your mom had it. Press on your doctor to get it done. You know, it's your health. Don't neglect your health. And if one doctor can't do it, there's another doctor that will, you know, and, and just don't. And because it's it can go undetected for so long, definitely just stay on top of it. If, if it's concerning you, follow up. I'm glad that you stated that because I'm glad that you had stated about the BRCA because um, a lot of people don't get that test done and a lot of people don't say that. Um, I had to get it done, um, and it scared my mother, but I had it. And so a lot of people are not their best advocate. And I, I liked how Francesca, Francesca had said, I had to push my doctor. I had to continuously say, Hey, there's something wrong with me. Um, and I had to do the same thing with my doctor as my doctor said, there's nothing wrong with you. I don't see it. But I had to continuously be on top of our doctor and say, there's something wrong with me. I know there's something wrong with me. And unless we continuously be pushing our doctors to say, listen, I know there's something wrong. This is my body. I know what my body feels like. This is mine. And I feel something. There's something wrong down there. I know there's something wrong. If anything goes with our own bodies up here or down there, we know there's something wrong with us when we're not feeling right. And so that specific test, although it doesn't say everything, it does tell the gene or the hormone that tells when you're, when you have that hormone, specifically when your ancestors have had it. So like my grandmother had cervical cancer. And so she did pass away from cervical cancer. Had they had caught it in enough time, she would not have died from cervical cancer. So it happens to a lot of family members, especially if they are Latinos or if they are of African American descent. And so we have to be very precautious to be on top of our doctors all the time and say, listen, I know what my body feels like. I know there's something wrong. And if we're not on top of them telling them that and saying, listen, wh why are you just passing me away? Why do you keep telling me that I'm kind of nuts? And so you have to be on top of them, you know? And I had to look up and know that 20 out of a thousand will find what is seen in the imaging is likely not cancer and return in six months later to keep watching and finding. And so we have to continuously be telling them. And this is one thing too, is five out of a thousand Five out of a thousand will be diagnosed with breast cancer. A hundred out of a thousand will return with additional conditions of breast cancer. So these two women were not even on the spectrum. These two women, because they were actually initially on the spectrum and these numbers are skewed. And Evangelist, you knew, you know that our numbers are skewed even with domestic violence. Numbers are always skewed. So we and know both of y'all found y'all lumped my mother found hers and and she had had a it, let me see what month was it? I want to say it was September, I don't remember. But she had had a mammogram about four months before that, before she found her own lump. So I know it didn't grow in four months. So why didn't the mammogram pick it up? What? And then that's the next question. Why Why are we paying all this money we pay through our insurance? I have Anthem, Blue Cross, Blue Shield. That's expensive. We paying that. But why are we getting a test if the test is really not going to show if there's a problem? Because that, that's a problem for me. That's if, God forbid, 
if it ever came down that I had it and they say where well, it's like stage two or three where it's been there, what well, I've gotten a mammogram every year since about I don't know, it's been a long, it's been a minute now, probably the last 10 years. So why 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 isn't it being picked up on these mammograms or they need to figure out Okay, should we go from mammogram to an ultrasound instead, if that's going to show it? Or should we go from a mammogram to a CAT scan? What, whatever it's going to take to show it, that's what we need to be doing. For me, that's how it had to happen because the ultrasound didn't show anything. And then it's the mammogram didn't show anything because, like she said earlier, your breast tissue, especially for young women, is really dense. So they couldn't see it. They couldn't see it at all. So I had to do an MRI, a CAT scan, in order for them to even see anything. And once I did that, that was like, oh, okay. We see it. It's, it's right there. <laughs> like I've been telling y'all this has been there for a while, but they finally was able to actually see it. So I definitely think you know your body better than anybody else. So if you feel like your doctor isn't doing what you need them to do, like she said, there's another doctor that will do it. You just have to keep pressing, keep pressing until you get right. the results that make you feel comfortable. Because you have to live with your body, not no one else. Agreed. Okay. And I think you should be proactive with your physician. Yeah. I asked a lot of questions. I, I did my own research. I yes. went in on medications. I went in on treatments. And it took years. You hear, I said 1993 when I was officially diagnosed in 2016. When I went to my doctor, my GYN in 2016, when I text her and I'm like, hey, like I found this. I went to her office. She took it as a joke. She literally took a needle, a biopsy needle and shoved it in my breast and was like, hey, OK, well, I'm just going to send you next door to the doctor next door. Mm -hmm. OK, you do know that was my last visit with her, right? So I was like, <laughs> That's That's okay. over. And I went to my doctor who actually found everything and diagnosed me. She looked at my records. She was like, I'm not understanding while, while you have been at this since 1993 at 13 and no one has decided to do any genetic testing. They haven't decided, they have, don't, you haven't had a plan in action where we could have caught this. And even though it was very early, you know, in stage, it took for her to sit down. And I think I went to her office every day, maybe two or three times a week, um, two or three times, sometimes during the day, but I worked at the hospital and we sat down and we developed a plan of action. We looked at different tests outside of bracket test having done looking at ovarian cancer looking at preventative ways so that i won't find myself in this position again and i really honestly pray and i asked god to send me a good team of doctors that was going to watch over me the way he wanted to watch over me and even though god is my was my ultimate healer I wanted a physical team that was going to look out for me. And, and I got that, you know, and like I said, I asked questions. I did my research. I asked questions. I wore medication. Well, what if this works? Well, what if we can't take that and do this, you know? And when I got this little hiccup call on Friday and they were like, Hey, we need you to go in on emergency. I still had questions. I emailed my doctors, you know, um, because you have to be, you have to be proactive and you have a yes. right to know. And like you said, with the insurances, we pay all this money, but I think we forget, we put a lot of our trust in doctors, but we have the knowledge. We have the internet right there where we can ask questions. There's support groups. There are different people that you can ask. And you also have to be in tune with your own body and, you know, with your own self and having breast cancer definitely taught me that. Yeah. 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 And I think that we forget that. I think we forget that we are allowed to say, hey, listen, I think it's all about insurance. I think it's about the insurance company and how doctors play games with our bodies and the insurance companies. They they play ball with them and we're allowed to tell them, listen, you kind of work for me a little bit. Not really, but this is my body and you guys have to understand this is not how it's going to play. If not, I'm going to find another doctor. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I mean, but, but that uh, our body should be the thing. It, it shouldn't even, I know it matters, but it shouldn't matter if you have state Medicaid or right. Blue Cross Blue Shield. Right. That should not be the priority. The priority should be, I mean, how can I save this person's life? How can I save right. this person from having four and five 
unnecessary surgeries or recurring events. Right. That should be the priority. But back to my other question, when y'all felt your lump, what did you feel? I felt mine kind of grew. So at first it kind of started off like a grape size. And then as the months proceeded, it became almost the size of an orange. So, and I would feel that sharp pain that you were talking about, like mine was like every five minutes. So I was constantly on like Tylenol, ibuprofen, just to kind of numb the pain. And the pain sometimes would be very crippling. I would be falling over because it hurt so much. So that, I felt the lump. And then as soon as, you know, maybe a couple of weeks later, the pain started to come. And it was like that until the surgery. So from May until December, I was having this reoccurring sharp pain. It felt like somebody stabbing me over and over and over again. Mm. Now, so you know what's funny? The the radiologist that I had that just did my mammogram, she said, people, if you have breast cancer, you don't have pain. See, so everybody may not be knowledgeable about what what symptoms they are what even though everybody is different each case is different i know that but you i mean i, mean, I think pain is i think for some people pain is kind of normal is is one if you don't get all the symptoms all the time you may just get some here and there so but for me i got the pain that's that's how i knew that something was wrong because it just the pain just didn't go away and the lump continued to grow Mm. What about you, Lindsay? When you I took my, no, when I took my wedding dress off, I had a lump the size of like an orange in my breast. So it was very noticeable. Really? Wow. Mm -hmm. And the day before didn't you didn't notice it? I didn't have it before the wedding. I had it after the wedding. So that when you and when you said about how do we go from stage zero to stage two or how does it all of a sudden appear? I have no idea because I've been asking myself that. I ask myself that about any cancer, whether it's pancreatic or like, how do we go? We take all these preventative measures and then boom, it's there. Yeah. So mine was a boom, it's there. And it just, it just happened. Yeah, it just happened. It just happened because mm -hmm. that's how it was. It just, it happened. Mm -hmm. It was, it just happened. It's just there. Yeah. It's just there. And I think with the symptoms, everybody is different because they ask you if it's pain. And then you, they do tell you, well, it's not breast cancer if you have pain. Um, Yeah, well, I have pain, you know. So I think it's every symptoms are different for everyone. Right, right, right. You're correct. You're correct. Because for, for different patients, it's different reasons. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, it is. It's just weird. I mean. And just think if Francesca didn't have any pain and her being so young, she would have just wrote it off. Right. And, you know, we're thankful. And that could have been an alert from God saying, hey, like, we need you. This is what you need to do, you know. And had she just kept ignoring it, we don't know what the outcome could have been today. Mm. Yes. Because I don't recall my mother saying she had any pain or anything. I remember she went for um, her mammogram because I just took her to the doctor she went for a regular appointment and normally my mother was just like a straight up person. She just say whatever she felt. So this particular day when she came back from the appointment, we was like, okay, mom, what the doctor say? She was like, oh, he said, I, I, you know, I could stand to lose some weight. Oh, I got breast cancer. I'm going to lose a, well, I ain't going to say the word, but a boob. She was like, you don't, you don't need but one anyway. And she made, you know, she made light of it mm -hmm. and joked about it. But she she never said she never experienced any pain or anything other than saying she found the lump when she was in the shower the night before. And she didn't, she had the left one removed. She didn't do the reconstructive because she wasn't going to do that. The day she went in for surgery, she had um, a cold. And they told her they couldn't do the surgery if she had a cold. She said, if I leave this hospital, I'm not coming back. We spent the night in the hospital lobby for them to get her cleared up, to make sure her lungs and stuff was clear because we knew if she left, she wasn't coming back. She was, she was not coming back. We spent the night in the hospital for them clearing her up with antibiotics and all that. 
and she had the surgery the next day. But she was a five-year survivor before she passed, but she didn't want to do the reconstruction and all that, but her cancer did come back and spread. And she had said if they came back, she wasn't going to um, do anything about it because the treatment was worse than having the disease, you know, which a lot of people say that, you know. So Yeah, treatment is, treatment is kind of hard. And, you know, you say she joked about it. Um, coping is hard. Yeah. Coping is hard. It's, it's 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 hard, and some people do. I made light of it, um, and then I struggled. I struggled secretly in the house. I still mm-hmm. do, you know. Um, so if that's how she dealt with it, you kind of just have to go with it because coping is very very hard, and hearing that diagnosis is very hard because you know, for forever we've always attached a death sentence to cancer, and when you have children, you panic. Mm-hmm. You have a spouse, you have, you know, you panic, period, you know, mm-hmm. um, and then you find ways to cope and deal with it until it actually hits you. I coped and I, I coped, but I didn't deal with it until I had, it was maybe like my 10th surgery and I totally freaked out. I, and I freaked out on the anesthesiologist that called me just to ask the simple questions. Mm-hmm. And I could, for two hours, he, I mean, he had to talk me off a ledge because I screamed, I cried. It was horrible on the phone. And he was like, I can just call in to ask you, like, you know, simple questions. But that's when it hit me when I had to answer all of those questions all over again for like the umpteen time. So trying to cope every day and look at the alterations that your body has been in, it is definitely, it's a lot. It's, it's a lot. And so this is a good segue into the next question. Knowing that it's uh, it's hard for us, and, and I know how hard it can be for, for us to deal with, you know, um, I have to ask both of you, you know, how hard was this for for your family members? You know, how hard um, was this for, for your husband? And how hard was this for, for your other family members, whether it was your brothers or your mother or, you know, your your uncles, your aunts, you know, your brothers and sisters, um, you know, I know how hard it was for my husband and, and my sons. How hard was it for, for your own family members to deal with going through this process? Um, for me, I'm going to do my best not to cry. No, it's fine. <laughs> and if you do, that's okay. <laughs> Tears are healthy. Tears are healthy. <laughs> for me, um, my mom, <laughs> thank God for my mom. She was very strong because I got diagnosed two weeks before my dad got diagnosed and he was stage four head and throat cancer. So she was struggling between trying to take care of her daughter and her husband at the same time. My dad, I'm not gonna say he lost his fight. He got his his healing on the other side. Right. So he passed away the, the day I came back from my bilateral surgery. So I didn't really get a chance to process for my situation. Um, not until maybe well after almost maybe, maybe, maybe like a year after everything. Cause I'm still trying to process losing my dad from around the same time. And I believe it was really hard for my mom cause just trying to struggle trying to be strong, be the strong person that she she is and make sure that, you know, I was okay trying to deal with the things with my dad and stuff. So I'm very grateful for my mom. I'm very grateful for my church family. I'm very grateful for my friends because you never know how much people care about you until something happens. Mm -hmm. And I didn't, I had no clue how much love and support we were gonna get. I'm very thankful, excuse me, I'm very thankful for my team of doctors because my doctors, once everything was, you know, rolling, we were moving. They were on it. My doc, my plastic surgeon to this day is still, you know, always talking to me. He has the best bedside manner any other doctor I've ever had in my life. So I'm very thankful for all the people that I have come into contact with during this time. So I think For the people who are going through, I feel like once you finally accept that, yes, I'm a breast cancer, I am a survivor, that yes, my body is going to look different. Yes, that 
dating for me is going to be different, that my clothes are going to fit different. Once you accept all of those things, I feel like you're able to regain control and that cancer no longer has control over you and you can move and do things and feel how you want to feel. Um, during that time, I also was in therapy. You know, I, I believe that you should go to therapy if you need yes. it. Mm-hmm. And my therapist always would say, you know, live in your emotion. You can be upset. You can be sad. You can be angry. Mm-hmm. But once you've gone through that, you have to move on. Mm-hmm. So you take your moment and then you leave your moment where it is and you move on. Because if you continue to carry that weight, you're never going to get through the process. And with cancer or any sickness, your attitude is everything. Like you have to have a positive attitude because that is going to be the the major factor in how you're going to get through it. Because all that is in your mind. Yeah. And if you feel defeated in your in your mind, your body is going to follow suit. Exactly. So I definitely think, you know, making sure you live in your emotions. But once you've done that, it's okay. All right, you can cry, you can be upset. Okay, but tomorrow, we're going to do this, and we're going to tackle this head on. And for the people who are supporting you, I would also encourage them to say that let us be free in our speaking. Sometimes, you know, you want to just coddle us and be comfort and just tell us everything is going to be okay. And sometimes, I know for me, I want to... I wanted to be a little negative. I wanted to say, you know, sometimes I feel like this is a death sentence. I feel like, you know, I'm not going to look the same. So just let me go through my emotions. You know, don't, oh, you know, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. I know it's going to be okay because I believe my faith is strong and I believe God is going to carry me either this way or that way. So I'm, I'm okay with that. But just let me, you know, express myself. So that's, I would say to those who are supporting those who have cancer, you know, just let us, just let us talk. Just let us be, be free in our thinking, you know, and then once we've gotten it all out, then you can give us a hug, but just let us, you know, let us vent, let us vent. That was and that's good. so necessary because you know what? My mother kept it in. She didn't talk to nobody. And for my mother, uh, the type of person she was that had so many friends when she got breast cancer, nobody was around. They was like, they didn't know what to say to her. She's still the same person. She just ain't got no hair. And that's one of the things my mother, she didn't want to go to therapy or counseling. My mother was half Indian and used to sit on her hair. And when she lost her hair, that broke her. Even more than having breast cancer, than losing the breast. Her hair is what broke her. And the fact that besides her kids, Nobody was around, and I couldn't even really deal with it then. My daughter, who was, I think, like 15 at the time, Ty, dealt with my mom, helping her with that tube thing with blood in it and all that. I was like, I, I don't mm-hmm. want to see all that. I don't want to see that. I didn't even look at her scar mm-hmm. until two years after, and that was on accident. I walked in the bathroom on her. So I couldn't even I couldn't even deal with none of that stuff. I I just didn't want to deal with it. I could, I could not accept it. I just couldn't accept it. But I know how important it is to have somebody to support you, a system, your family, your friends. I don't care if I got no hair and 10 wigs. Y'all know I got some wigs in the closet. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I got some wigs, braids, curls, straight, what you need. Don't, don't. Treat people like they're different because they have something going on. You know what I'm saying? And it may be hard for people to understand, but those who are supporting have to understand. Friend is the same person I used to dance with. Lindsay is the same person I used to dance or have not, let me not say used to, have danced with, have taught, have danced with, have been at events with. Okay, they just had a little something, something going on. That doesn't change who they are as a human being. And we have to remember that. We have to remember that. And like Fran said, I agree with her. Let me have my moment. Yeah. Let me have my moment. People yes. lose weight, gain weight. I feel like I'm fat. I'm trying to lose weight. Okay. Maybe today I'm feeling skinny. Okay. Yeah. Maybe today I'm not. But let me let me have that. Cynthia. Yes. Let me have that. Okay? <laughs> 
So I totally understand that that <laughs> feeling. I of love not, it. You know, it's it's important. And I love it. I love how you said, you know, um, we need our moment. Um I know that it, 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 we need our moment to, to vent and we need our moment to have that moment to even decompress and compress and have our moment to say, you know, I might need your support today, but I might not. I might need your support to scream and I might not. I might need your support to say, just get away from me today. Today's not your day. <laughs> Today's not your day. But it's nice to know that you're here. And I love what your therapist said, because sometimes a lot of us, and I love that you did go to therapy, Francesca, because a lot of us think that we can do it on our own. And right. it's great uh, that that you did think, you know what, I do need therapy. Um, and a lot of us, when we go through a process, um, we don't reflect on these situations, we don't think that it's a moment of lamenting. And when we go through this process, uh, we are in a moment of lament. We are missing a place or a time in which we are saying, I am missing something. I am missing a piece of me and I need to regain it. And a lot of people don't think that. You know, missing yourself is very hard. And that is a moment of lamenting. And you need to reflect on that. And it's wonderful how you said, you know, I have to really slow down and I need help to really lament me. I have to lament myself. And I need a moment of that. I need a moment of reflection. And it's great that you were able to go out and talk to someone about that. And for me, I wasn't able to reflect. And so a lot of us who need reflection to be able to say, hmm, I need to, I need to talk to someone, even when it's just a friendship, to, to be able to say, I need a, a good friend to reflect upon, to be able to, to talk to. And it doesn't have to be your family members because family members are too close. They're too close to us. But just to reflect upon a feeling in which they're separate and just say, I have to reflect on losing a piece of me. Because remember, we're women and women who lose something of themselves. It's hard, you know, but it's wonderful how you were able to do that. And you're such an expander. Both of you are. Both of you are able to reflect on that. Um, and so, um, I want to be able to take a little bit of a moment and just give a space and say, what have you reflected on right now? That reflection moment. And what have you reflected on that you think, man, I wish I would have really given that space to help someone else and what what is an advice that you can give someone right now at this moment lindsay i kind of want to give you that space what would be an advice that you can give to somebody that's live 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 very i mean very point i always tell and then doing this process i've adopted oh the God. model that to, to live out loud. Cancer taught me to live. Your life can be changed in the quick second of a diagnosis. Mm -hmm. So cancer taught me to live and to live with no regrets. We um, spend a lot of time with the shoulda, coulda, wouldas. We spent a lot of time with the unforgiveness. Unforgiveness hardens your heart, but not only does it harden your heart, the heart controls the body. So exactly. it affects different parts of your body. So when we hold on to all of that, it's still wearing tear on your body. And I just want you to live. And any advice I give anybody, I had a girlfriend call me yesterday. I'm like, sis, okay, we got it. Just live. And it's not that I take it lightly. But when your life has been threatened by something that is life altering, live. We have a caller. Uh, caller, um, thank you for calling guidance to a good heart. How can we? Uh, thank you so much. Uh, what is your name? Hello? Yes. Hi. How are you doing? Hi. How are you? Good afternoon. 
Can I get your name? First off, yes, my name is Jonathan. Hi, Jonathan. How are you? I'm doing pretty good. I want to applaud, applaud you guys for your testimonies on today. I really appreciate that. Thank but you, I have a, I have a, you're welcome. I have a question for um, the young lady with the dreads. I can't remember what her name is. Um, Francesca the, the, the or Lindsay? Lindsay look. Um, she has the she has the dreads with the with the I think it, I came like dark in one string of something over there. She looked like Millie Vanilli a little bit. Fran. Fran. Mm-hmm. Fran. <laughs> yes. Yes. Fran. Yes. How are you today? What was the question? I didn't hear the question. I'm sorry. My my question to her is, um, I know that this uh, plays a lot of effect on the family life and the family structure. I wanted to know how does that um, or what does that do to, um, you know, the emotionalism for your, your family and your husband? Because um, I'm sure that, the, you know, the diagnosis plays a part on him as well. So how did that affect your family household as well as your husband? I think the question is for Lindsay because it's Lindsay. I'm, 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 <laughs> it's actually you, Lindsay. Yeah, I think, <laughs> yeah, but the one, it's, the, it's the young lady in the corner. I, I don't know it's what Lindsay. her name is. It's Lindsay. <laughs> okay, so how did it affect, well, my husband is a very strong person. So he's not, he doesn't always show his emotion. And I think for any spouse, when their other spouse is sick, they try to be the strong. They try to be the strong. And so where I was weak, my husband had to play that strong role. And he had to carry my emotion and how I felt as well as his at the same time. So I do know that it affected him. Um, I know times where he verbally said to me he was tired of seeing me in pain. He was tired of the surgeries. I mean, we had people in and out the house because when I had surgeries, I couldn't lift um, heavy things and he works another shift, you know, so I had to have people come and cook. My mom was always here and we need to get a little, it it actually, in my opinion, I think it brought us a little bit closer together um, because we had to be there immediately on a, on another level of strength for one another. And I had to be a little, I had to show more compassion for him. And then I had to understand where he was, even though he wasn't verbally saying it. And then he had to understand where I was, even though I wasn't verbally saying it. And he had to see me in my weakest points that he couldn't fix and where he didn't understand. So our roles kind of, it was, it was a, it was a support system. It was a struggle, but it was a support system. Okay. Very nice. And I have another quick question, if, if you don't mind. Mm-hmm. And, okay, and that question is, um, for, and this is for any of the, the panel guests there, is there, was there ever a moment where um, fear, the, the, that moment of fear set in? Was there ever a moment of, of, of fear of the unknown? Absolutely. Oh, that. Oh, definitely. <laughs> Fear tried today when I pulled up on that hospital parking lot, you know, for radiation orientation. And I had, it was fear. I told my husband last night, I didn't sleep because I'm going one to a new facility with a new doctor, you know, and I'm getting ready to go into radiation and nobody knew about it. I mean, my friends are just hearing about it today, you know, and it, it is, it's scary because I had, I, I opted out of chemo. I I did not want chemo. I decided to do radiation. However, the side effects of radiation are way different than the side effects of chemotherapy. And if I knew then what I knew now, I probably wouldn't have opted for either one of them, you know, but I, I, you know, because of the side effects of it, I'm back in this place, you know, where they know I don't have cancer, but the only way that they can treat my blood being all crazy is with the radiation and the infusion. So you're scared every day. I'm not just scared for myself. I was scared because I had, at the time, Corey was, my son was 14, you know, 13 or 14. I was scared for him. He was scared. I have another son. You know, they were scared. Grand's husband, you're scared. And even if it's not for yourself, it's for the people that you could possibly leave behind. Right. Right. And, and I think you're right. I mean, um, you know, I think my kids were little at the time. 
And so we were, I was scared, you know, I mean, it's a human condition. And so, yeah, you indeed. know, the human condition is that I have to leave my husband behind. I don't know if my kids are going to be okay. Am I going to see them again? You know, they want me mm -hmm. to be strong. I have to be strong. I can't cry in front of them. I can't cry in front of my mm -hmm. husband. You know what? Everybody wants me to be a strong individual. I have to put up a front as well for, you know, for the faith as well. But right. I also, I right. also want to be the person that faith wants me to be at the time. But I also am looking at the flesh. So I'm faith, mm -hmm. but I'm flesh. So it was a faith right. combating my flesh. And that was my issue. My issue was like, I am a faith born person. You know, God has not given me a spirit of fear, but a love and a power of sound mind. But I was battling my flesh all day. That was mm -hmm. my problem. And so my problem was like, I don't want to leave my kids. And, you know, I know that I'm going to be okay in heaven. But I was like, I love my children and I love my husband. And I'll be fine in heaven, but are my kids going to be okay? Is my and I think that's okay? natural. And I, did, I, totally I you know, natural. Yeah, yeah, I used to be so, so upset when people would say, oh, no fear. Yeah. You know, I was, <laughs> you know, was like, excuse me? Are you in my shoes? <laughs> <laughs> right. Excuse me? <laughs> what are you talking yeah. about? <laughs> no fear. And it was sometimes, and I'm really being honest, Cynthia, that was sometimes where I would be like, I don't want to hear the Bible today. I don't yes. want to hear about God today. And I, you know I get saying? you. I understand. Yeah. Like, I'm let's with live you. In reality. Let's live. And I'm and I'm not negating God, but I need to be flesh today. You know what I'm saying? Right. Like, I need even, to be angry today. I need to be yeah. sad today. I need to right. scream today. I need you to be away yeah. from me today. Yes. And, and it's natural. Right. It was totally natural <laughs> for me. It was natural. I needed to close the door and I need you to be away from me today. Right. That right. was a natural, it's a total natural human thing for me to close the door and yell. And it was natural. It was natural. Mm -hmm. And and call her, I'm, I'm, this was a natural human emotion for me to say, I'm angry at you today. And it was, there was a time in which I was angry at God because I kept saying, why me? I, I'm mm -hmm. a good, I'm a good mm -hmm. Christian. Why me, God? I don't understand. This was me at a moment where I was fighting God. It was a real battle with God at a moment in which I was tug of warring with him going, mm -hmm. why me? I have babies. Don't, you can't do this to me because I love my kids. You know, I'm, I'm going back and forth to, you know, baseball with my son. This is not a good time. And I was back and forth with him. Right. And, you know, and I... I was battling that you have to have faith, daughter, kind of thing. And I was like, this is not good for me right now, God. You but want I me think, to have faith. I, I think the thing, thing <laughs> people have to, re have to remember is when, when something bad happens, Christian people don't become unchristian because they tap into their human. We're right. human first. Right. We are human first. And just like Francesca said, we have to be true to ourselves. And just like with COVID, when this stuff came, I'm telling y'all, I was afraid. It, it still bothers me because some people don't care and they take it lightly. My faith is strong in God, but that doesn't mean I don't have concerns about right. things. Right. You know, if it was me, I would ha I would have issues too. Right. I would have concerns. I have kids, although they're grown. I have grandkids, mm -hmm. right. baby grandkids. Right. So right. I would have concerns, and there's nothing wrong with that. Then, oh, I thought she advantage was a Christian. I am, but right. I'm also human. Right. Okay? Right. That's what you gotta right. remember. And I Just think my friends she in her flesh. No, I'm in my emotions. I'm I'm, my emotions. I'm being true to myself. If I if I didn't be true to myself, I wouldn't say I'm worried about leaving this earth and leaving my kids or leaving my grandkids or my friends or whatever. You have to be true to that because when you don't, you know what happened? You people, they sit away and they act like nothing's going on and it's all in their head and they get all depressed. Those are the ones that commit suicide. Those are the ones that don't tell people what's really going on mm -hmm. or how, they, oh, I'm good. I'm good. I ain't, ain't nothing but a breast, you know? No, it's not, it's not even all that. 
Cause <laughs> fake acting, whatever. Be true to yourself. Right. You want to cry all day today? Cry. That's what you do. Mm -hmm. this, uh, this past weekend at my auntie's funeral, I told my niece and nephew, if y'all want to cry, cry. I don't care if you want to cry every day. But don't let nobody okay. tell you, now it's time to get it together. No, this is their mother. Wow. This mm -hmm. is their mother. My mother has been gone 17 years, and I still cry. Right. Well, I thought you got, what? That's my right. mother. Right. My mother, not yours, mine. Right. Right. So if I feel like I want to have some emotions, because my mama not here, I'm going to do that. I'm going to be true to myself. That does not negate my faith in God. Right. It does not. And right. that's what people need to understand. Be true to yourselves. I don't know about you, Francesca, but I know I had an emotional struggle. Like, I, people, you know, you guys always see me. I'm smiling. Well, Trisha, I'm always smiling. I'm always joking. But I struggle. I, right. I mean, when I had that mastectomy, yeah. I took showers in the dark because I did not want to look at myself without breasts. Mm -hmm. You know, I when I went back to work for the first time, I think I went back in February after November. When I went back to work, I sat in the parking lot and my first lady at the time, she had to coach me two and a half hours to go into my job because I went back to work without breasts, you know. Um, and she I cried and I was like, Well, they're gonna notice me. You know, she's like, Lindsay, nobody's gonna notice the fact that you don't have breasts. And I'm like, Yeah, they are, you know. I'm like, people are gonna be looking at me, and I struggled and I still have faith in God. However, it was a physical thing. I told my husband, yeah. he's like, Well, don't get them put back on. No, I need them because it's part of who we are as women, you yeah. know, it's part of our identity. Um, and I I mean, I struggle and yeah, deeply read in faith, and I love God, yeah. but it was a struggle, you know, it was a struggle for me, and it still is. I experienced weight gain from the pregnant zone and all the medications right. and you can't control it and you got to watch yourself go through this altering, you know, altering phase. And it's not that I don't have, it, I'm, I'm human, you know, it's a human thing. And mm -hmm. I felt like I was entitled to that. And I, even though I did it in private, in my own private space, when my friends wasn't around or my husband wasn't around, I struggled with depression and fighting this thing. You know, it was, it was real. And I dare somebody not tell me, Oh, you can't cry. You got to fight. You're not in my shoes. You know, yeah. you did not get that diagnosis. They turned your whole life around. And for the rest of my life, I have to live cautiously. You understand? Because I'm rock a positive. I'm not claiming it, but the paperwork says this. Right. But I'm not going to live in ignorance and say, I mean, I know that God is a healer, but I'm not going to live in ignorance and just go ridiculous buck wild because I know that God is a healer. I'm not going to be ignorant to what the paper in the lab works say. He gave us doctors for a reason. So for the rest of my life, I have to live cautiously because this thing altered, you know, my whole life. So it's not that I don't have faith. I, I'm, 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 I'm using wisdom, you know, right now and, and, and moving forward like that. But it is, it's a difficult, any diagnosis, you know, it's, it's difficult. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I think that's what it is. I think that, you know, people have to understand, like I said, it's, it's a moment of lamenting, reflecting and having to acknowledge what we've lost, uh, what we've gained, what we've lost and how it influences us as women. And, and not only women, cause men also go through breast cancer, whether you guys know it or not, mm -hmm. uh, there is, there is a, a percentage of how men are also um, affected. It says one in a, a thousand men are mm -hmm. diagnosed with breast cancer in their lifetime, which um, for me, I had no idea until I actually started researching this. But before we even um, leave out of this, because I think we've gone over our time. <laughs> this is so interesting because I love going home, mm -hmm. talking about anything interesting. Before we get out of here, um, I kind of want to ask you ladies um, about any books that you're thinking about maybe writing or anything interesting that you're looking into or anything like that. Any journaling that you're looking into either ladies at all? I am considered, considering journaling my process. Yeah. 
and the post process because it's a recovery. What happens after recovery? What happens to that strong friend when she's diagnosed and everybody expects you to still be strong? With it? You know, um, I want to move forward to help women on that side. I do have a women's um, group called Lioness Women, and it is breaking free from faith, from fear to faith. Um, and I do want to start incorporating once I get through my process. I didn't want to start anything in my process and not knowing when it was going to end. Um, so now that I'm at the end of the process, minding this little small hiccup, I can then start incorporating breast cancer awareness into my women's group. I don't want to designate just October as the breast cancer awareness month. Mm -hmm. um, I don't want to participate in the pink washing for breast cancer month because it's mm -hmm. the all year long. I wear my pink all year long because every time I take my shirt off, I have to look at my breasts, you know, um, and I am I'm, I'm just privy to that. So I want to share that the extensive journey, not just in September, but all year long. Um, with breast cancer survivors and younger women that are coming through because the diagnosis are becoming younger and younger. So I want to go back and then share with them. Yeah. And if you can leave us a link to that group, we would love to share it on guidance to a good heart so that we're able to share that group with other survivors. We would okay. love to be able to share that, that link and be able to have other survivors and their family members be, you know, privy to that group. That would be great. And that way we can continue, you know, that cycle of other survivors linking up to you. That would be okay. great. Yeah. So we are right on Instagram at Lioness Women. We are in the process of birthing and blooming, um, but we are Lioness Women right on Instagram. You can find me there and okay. you can get all your updates if you hit me and follow me there. Yeah. Wonderful. And we will make sure anybody who's watching on Guidance to a Good Heart and all our other groups, please know that we will share that link for you guys on there. Do not worry. We will put a link for you guys. Um, Evangelist and I will put the link for you guys on here. Um, so, um, Francesca, and if you want to put your Instagram link for us, that way, if anybody, any of the survivors would like to, you know, link up with you, or if they have any questions, we'll make sure that they link up with you on Instagram as well. That way, if they have any other further questions, you know, they can link up with you on Instagram. That'd be awesome. All right. I think that we've gone overboard. It was a good show. Thank you, ladies, for being here. And I appreciate yeah, you guys. And Evangelist, like always, you are amazing. <laughs> she's, like, she's like, thank you. Well, guys, I appreciate you guys being here. And like always, remember Mixstation, www.mixstation.com. Do not forget they have other shows other than Guidance to a Go Hard. So please do not forget to go on www.mixstation.com. They're on YouTube. They're on Deezer. They're on Apple Podcasts and other stations. So do not forget to go on there. And like I always say, you're beautiful. You are lovely. I love you. And thank God that God loves you too. Okay, guys. Thank you, Bye. ladies. Thank, Thank you, you ladies.